On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to be addressing what I feel to be one of the most important subjects to Christians throughout history, the rapture and resurrection of the church. Titus was uh, one of Paul's associates to whom Paul wrote a special letter addressed only to him. It's one of the few letters in the uh, New Testament that, were, that is named for a person. And to Titus, the apostle Paul wrote, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The term blessed hope is extremely important, and I think it's important for us to address today on Prophecy in the News. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the imminency of the return of Christ. And JR, this is going to be among the more enjoyable things we discuss on Prophecy in the News because this is the heart, the core of the message, the idea of hope. And you know, from time to time, and you might want to talk about this a little bit, we encounter, oh, can we call it a little depression, maybe a little worry, a little anxiety. Oh, the Lord did not come on Rosh Hashanah. Mercy, mercy, how long? Are we going to have to wait another year, two or three, or seven or eight? Or you know, And we encounter yes. this. Yes. But I, I think the blessed hope really uh, contradicts that, that kind of an idea. Uh, it, it, it should at least help put our minds to rest. And, mm -hmm. and for the folks who are watching, uh, we want you to know that Jesus can come at any time. This is the important uh, message, I think, of the New Testament. Uh, the disciples were not told uh, when the Lord was coming. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, he was about to ascend back into heaven. The disciples asked him, Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Looking forward to that future time when Jesus would come and set up a kingdom, set Israel at the head of the nations, and rule over the world as King of kings and Lord of lords. Wilt thou at this time, was their question, and Jesus gave to that first century group he said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, indicating that it could come at any time, that they were to continue to look for him. And when Jesus ascended back into heaven and the clouds received him out of their sight, two men in white apparel stood by them, saying, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven, indicating that they who were watching him go into heaven could possibly someday see him arrive again. Mm. Yeah. And uh, this is the basic message of the New Testament, isn't it? Yeah, the blessed hope. Hope is an attitude, really. It, it is, uh, it's an inner idea. Um, I suppose the, uh, we've heard, all heard the uh, uh, the illustration of the bus stop. You know, you're standing out there uh, waiting for a bus, and if someone drives down the street and sees you standing and waiting for the bus, uh, they won't notice. It'll just look normal to them that this person is standing and waiting for a bus. This is an obvious bus stop, and that's what you do. If you stand out on the street at a place other than a bus stop, people will look at you and say, what are you standing there for? <laughs> There's no reason for you to be standing, particularly if you stood out there for a half hour or an hour. Mm -hmm. The idea is that normal Christian living involves an attitude of waiting. And within this, there's the idea of the blessed hope. I wanted to read a very familiar scripture uh, which we read when we talk about the communion. In 1 Corinthians 11, sp uh, speaking of the Lord's Supper, and when he had given thanks, uh, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup uh, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. In other words, you proclaim 
or demonstrate the Lord's death until the time of his coming. Now, within this, J.R., there's not a clause that says <clears throat> uh, you will be taking this supper for X number of years or you will be taking this supper to remember the Lord's death until he come. Until a certain set of events happens, this just says demonstrate the Lord's death until he comes. So right in the heart of the Christian communion, that is the fellowship we have with the, with the risen Savior, there is this idea of waiting for the coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, Gary, it's interesting to me that there is no scripture in the New Testament that indicates to the first century believers mm -hmm. in any of Paul's letters that uh, Christians would have to uh, face the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, or any of the judgments of the tribulation period. That's right. But there is a doctrine aloft today where men are saying that Christians will go through the tribulation period, that they will have to suffer, let's say, five years or more of the mm -hmm. tribulation period, mm -hmm. and then just before the seventh trumpet will be, or at the time of the seventh trumpet, will be taken out into right. heaven. Uh, this could not possibly have been the attitude of first century Christianity, could it? Mm. Well, J.R., the very first letter that we have uh, written by Paul is the letter to the Thessalonians. Thessalonian believers were a very unique group of people. Apparently, they, they were a group of people who just, without any question, leaped into a position of faith in the early church and became mm -hmm. remarkable for the fact of their faith, their willingness to accept the apostles' doctrine without question. They simply began to believe. And Paul com uh, complimented these people on their faithfulness. In yes. fact, he was more complimentary toward the Thessalonians uh, than any other group of Christians. Now, interestingly, the Thessalonians lived in the Roman Empire at the seaport of Thessalonica, which was a, a Roman-controlled seaport. And, uh, the, of course, the, the early Christians were Jews. We call them Hebrew Christians. The Romans didn't have much use for the Jews, and particularly at that time, at the time of the writing of this letter, the Emperor Claudius had issued a decree from Rome stating that uh, Jews would become second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. So you had these expelled people... Expelled them from Rome, in expelled fact. Expelled them from Rome. And so you, you have the Thessalonians uh, uh, having all this faith in the midst of persecution, really. You know, it's interesting that 1 Thessalonians was the first of the New Testament books uh, some say A.D. 54, some even back it up to A.D. 51 for the writing of it. This was during the last years of Claudius and Nero, of course, came to power upon the death of Claudius, for Claudius was poisoned by Nero's mother. Mm. Mm. <laughs> In chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, he writes to the church at Thessalonica, and this is the earliest of all the books written with uh, 20, maybe 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years at the outset from Calvary, and he writes, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven. That means that these early first century Christians mm -hmm. were waiting for Jesus to come from heaven. So that is an imminent expectancy, isn't it? it it really is. Now, let's talk about imminency for a moment. Uh, imminency is the idea of the bus stop. You're waiting for that bus, standing out there, and uh, maybe you've had to brave the weather, uh, and you're going to do it because you, want, you know the bus is coming and you want the ride. And you don't know exactly when. You know the bus schedule gives you a rough idea, but you know how these buses are. Yes. <laughs> Plus or minus 15 minutes. Right. And you know it's coming. You just don't know when. But you're in a state of expectancy. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting thing to me here is that uh, these Christians in the first century were waiting for Jesus to come. And even though the Apostle Paul was a devout Jew who observed all of the Jewish ritual of the holy days and mm -hmm. what have you. He had evidently not taught the Thessalonians 
that Jesus had to come on a particular day. I know when we get over to chapter 4 and it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Uh, there have been some in the last uh, several years that have suggested that the rapture need, needs to occur on Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, or the Jewish New Year in mm -hmm. September. Um, I don't see that as the thrust of his message here. I think that first century... Uh, Gentile Christianity uh, could look for him to come at any time. The point is, if Jesus can only come on Rosh Hashanah, then the other 364 days we don't have to worry about it or we don't have to look for his coming. So everyone has to get ready for his coming in August and prepared for his coming in September. But come October, if he hadn't come, then we can relax for another 11 months. Mm -hmm. I don't see this. Do you, Gary? No, I don't. And in fact, that's sort of borne out in 1 Corinthians in the uh, 15th chapter where Paul writes about resurrection and the order of the resurrections. He even mentions feast days. Uh, but he doesn't say Christ has to come on a feast day. Uh, he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Christ was the first fruits. In other words, he mm -hmm. rose on the feast of first fruits. Yes. But then Paul does not go on and say afterwards, uh, they that are Christ when he comes on Rosh Hashanah. He mm -hmm. does not say that. That's uh, right. The idea is that Jesus fulfilled all the feasts and they are in his hands that it, from this point forward. In fact, if one were to take that verse and build upon it the, I, the concept of his second coming, it would sound like he would have to return on the feast of first fruits as well. It, it does, in fact, uh, or mm, the next feast, of course, that comes after first fruits would be Pentecost. And you might think, well, right. maybe he could come on Pentecost. But, uh, well, <laughs> and uh, we've talked about that. Pentecost is Gary, a type of the, of the uh, coming. Yeah. In our book, Hidden Prophecies in the Song of Moses, on our dealing with the day of Pentecost, this is what I wrote. I, I wrote... Um, the age-old question has been, when? We are anxious for that day to come. Will the resurrection occur on a future Rosh Hashanah, as some believe? I think we should not put all of our eggs into one basket. Let us not forget that of that day and hour knoweth no man. And I go on to say on this page, there are at least three other Jewish festivals that offer prophetic views of the resurrection. At these three harvest festivals, all Jewish men were required to travel to Jerusalem and, quote, appear before the Lord, end of quote. Now, the fascinating thing is you can't put it down. There, there is really no, of, the, of these three festivals, mm -hmm. he could come. And I think that his coming is, for, for the Jewish people is tied to the festivals, but for Gentile Christianity, we don't even observe these holy days. No, we don't. And uh, therefore, the rapture of the church does not appear to be tied to the observance of Jewish festivals. This is important for us to understand. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that he cannot come on Rosh Hashanah or Pentecost or Passover or Feast of First Fruits but that he is not required to come at that time, mm -hmm. not for Gentile Christianity anyway. In the book of Luke, we have a teaching from Jesus' own mouth, Luke 12, 35 and following, where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's talking about the steward. He was talking about the good steward, that is a, a man who uh, keeps the things of the Lord, keeps his house in order. And he says, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights be burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open to him, uh, unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that, ye shall gird, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth to serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or in the third watch, find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. 
Now, we could talk about this parable in detail, in terms of its meaning. Where does it fit into the church age? Or are we talking about the tribulation here? But really, generically, J.R., this passage is talking about an attitude. And it, it has that, that closing statement, the Son of Man cometh at an, at an hour when you think not. Yes. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about well, that? Well, indicating that he could come in any generation. Uh, to that first generation, they were to watch for his coming at any time. He could come and rapture and resurrect uh, the saints. Then when the second generation came along, they had that same admonition. And so in uh, following the first century, let's say in the second century, uh, those generations that lived there also looked for the Lord to return. He said, I'm coming back. And so many scriptures in the mm -hmm. New Testament tell them, I'm coming at any time, just be ready. And of course, the scripture tells us that if they had known that he would not come in that generation, or for two or three or ten generations right. down the road, then there would not have been that urgency for holiness. That's right. And by the way, it is important that we, ha that we live holy lives today waiting for that second coming or for the rapture which uh, will come and take us uh, into heaven so that he can pour out his judgment upon the world. Now, there are signs of the times. And uh, even the Thessalonians uh, back in the early 50s, uh, because Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome and uh, began a persecution of Jews. And then Nero, of course, you know, the Apostle Paul, from the writing of his first book, 1 Thessalonians, saw Nero come to power all the way through until Paul was beheaded in A.D. 66 during Nero's rule, so most of Paul's ministry and the writing of the 14 books of the New Testament was during the time of Nero. And yet the Apostle Paul uh, wrote ex uh, in an expectant way, telling them now, be ready, he's coming. Uh, stay pure, stay clean, be ready, mm -hmm. he's coming at any time. Look for him, expect him. That was his message as well as those down through the centuries and ours today. If that's not the doctrine of eminency, I don't know what is. It certainly is. And, and uh, in this whole idea, J.R., there's another idea, and that is the idea of cleansing or purification. Some have been teaching of late that the church will have to go through at least part of uh, the coming tribulation in order to be cleansed or purified. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of mail. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls that express this view. Um, and here's a gentleman writing, and he's earnestly asking a question, uh, which, by the way, we seriously intend to answer. Uh, he says, and I'm quoting, to date, every book I've read defending the pre-tribulation view does not address the pre-wrath view and also attacks other views to prove the pre-tribulation rapture position. And he says, Please answer my question concerning this. I highly respect and admire both of you guys. I'd like to thank this gentleman for his nice letter and remind him that he's not the only one asking this question. J.R., there is the teaching that which you brushed upon a minute ago that the church will be sort of purified through the, the first five years or so of the tribulation. That is until the opening of the seventh seal, at which time it will be taken out. Uh, the church will go through the uh, the opening of the first four seals, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, which is a time of cataclysm to say the least, mm -hmm. uh, a time of global upheaval, war, famine, pestilence, every kind of imaginable horror, earthquake. And, uh, and in going through that period, we'll be somehow purified, made ready for the rapture, which will occur just prior to the opening of the seventh seal. Now, we don't hold this view. No. What do you say to the gentleman who, who says, every book I've read def def defending the pre-trib view does not address this question? I don't think the New Testament addressed the question. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, in fact, in verse 1, he says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. 
I want you to know that the thief can come at any time. Mm. And uh, so there's nothing that precedes the rapture and resurrection, which he just addressed in the previous verses, yes. chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 16 and 17. When he comes down to verse 9 of chapter 5, he says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Hmm. This is the wrath of God that is uh, one of the prominent subjects throughout the Bible, that in the last days, when the day of the Lord comes, God is going to pour out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. When Christ returns, he's going to come and judge the world. And this is the primary doctrine of his second coming. And when, when this time comes, uh, just before the battle of Armageddon and the uh, uh, second coming of Christ, there will be a seven-year period of tribulation in which the wrath of God will be poured out upon the world. In, in Revelation chapter 15, we have these seven angels pouring out, the, mm -hmm. or 16, pouring out the vials of wrath. We are saved from that wrath to come. That's the important thing. And J.R., let me say, too, that in Revelation 6, 16, we have an interesting statement. At that time, the kings of the earth and great men and rich men are going to be hiding in the caves of the rocks. The first six seals having been opened, mm -hmm. these people are in terror. And, and they speak to the mountains and the rocks, saying, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So they've already clearly been experiencing wrath even during the period of the seals, in yes. my opinion. Right. So the tribulation period begins during this time. And uh, therefore, there, there is no reason to think that Christians are going to have to experience any of that seven years. Uh, we do not know when the Lord is coming but I'm convinced that the Scripture teaches a pre-tribulation rapture simply because we are not appointed to wrath. And the wrath of God is spelled out very clearly uh, in the prophecies uh, to, to be within that time frame of the last seven years. And that's a Jewish seven-year period. Yes, it is. Just before we go out on a break here, I want to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the blessed hope. Indeed it is.